Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage president and co-founder of the Acton Institute, Chris Maron. Good evening, everyone. How was your day? We've got a great program ahead of us, but before we get to tonight's speaker, we're going to make a special presentation. The Acton Institute established the Guardian of Freedom Award in 2009 in commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall to recognize the ongoing contributions of leaders who have demonstrated an outstanding commitment to liberty. Laureates have dedicated their professional lives to advancing the principles of freedom and guarding them for subsequent generations. Since 2009, this award has only been presented three times. Tonight, we will present it for the fourth time. When he was just seven years old, our laureate told his father he wanted to take piano lessons and become a pianist. But his father said, oh no, when you grow up, you're going to start a business like your grandfather. And in 1973, at age 24, Salim Matar did start a business. And despite an international oil crisis and discouragement from close friends and family, Salim co-founded the car rental company Localiza. With six used cars and a friend doing all the work themselves, washing and repairing the cars, customer service, driving, etc., he launched what is today the most valuable publicly traded car rental company. What a tremendous entrepreneurial accomplishment. Salim was introduced to Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek at the age of 16. Today at Acton University, I witnessed a very special moment when Salim held a first edition copy of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And by the way, many of you may not know, but there is a room here at Acton University hosted by the Remnant Trust where you too can hold this book and many other treasures of Western civilization. This room is located in Grand Gallery EF, directly across from the Acton Bookshop. After reading Smith, Salim became a zealous defender of free market liberalism. And despite adverse political economic conditions, Salim Matar, with a handful of close friends and mentors, has created a very strong foundation movement for freedom in Brazil. Salim Matar is indeed Brazil's most important investor in free market ideas, and we may never know the full extent of the good work he has allowed, because much of his work is done below the radar. But he is undoubtedly the most important agent in raising up a new class of principled leaders in Brazilian business, civil society, and politics. Of the 120 plus Institutes that support the values of economic liberty, Salim is almost certainly behind all of them. Now, if you'll join me, let's watch a short film about tonight's award winner. In Brazil, our, both our politics and economics have been based in authoritarian interventionist uh, visions to what the country should be. We are facing the threat of a judicial dictatorship. We also are seeing many politically motivated uh, pre imprisonments. And this kept us from developing and flourishing. So when it comes to this recent wave of people discovering the ideas of liberty, Salim's by, by far one of the most prominent activists and supporters, making those ideas available to every Brazilian. And we've seen people as Salim Matar, for instance, that is a sponsor of many of these initiatives. 
playing a very, very, very important role in this political change in Brazil. I know him to be a man who has worked very hard in the Liberty space, obviously a successful entrepreneur, uh, but also someone who volunteered to work in government, which is often a thankless task. And he worked very hard to make government work for the citizens of Brazil. He personally was interested about my ideas, about what I was going to do. And if it wasn't for uh, his support, I'm sure I was not going to be here today. But he really has an aptitude for being a vendor, an aptitude absolutely unique, that has helped us a lot, I think, in the sales of our ideas, in the economy of the market. Well, Salim is actually a leader among leaders. And he is doing a great job in our country to make free markets, the ideas of freedom, be uh, defended throughout our country. And that just doesn't happen overnight. That happens through decades of cultivation and the spreading of ideas and encouraging people, building of institutions like think tanks. So all of that work beneath the surface of what is obvious has been driven by people like Salim. Salim tem um perfil de lutador absoluto sobre essas ideias, esses princípios. Ele acredita profundamente. Então, ele, ele se envolve não em termos só teóricos, mas absolutamente pragmáticos. Someone as successful as him probably would have an easier life when, well, they just retire and go away. And Salim's close to the country he's fighting for. He's close with them who are willing to fight this fight with him. Nós somos realmente verdadeiros irmãos dessa luta da, do pensamento da economia de mercado da liberdade individual. Né? Acton Institute's work rests on the assumption that ideas are powerful. They are powerful forces put into the hands of leaders can transform our societies and the world. Salim Matar is an example of someone who encountered these ideas of liberty and it transformed his thinking. It inspired his activities not only through business, but in remaking civil society and politics in Brazil. É difícil achar um segundo Salim, né? Então eu diria que cabe um profundo agradecimento e reconhecimento. Salim has done already so much for Brazil that what we can do at the moment is thank him for all he has done and thank him even more for the willingness to continue to support so many good initiatives in Brazil. Change in Brazil means he's changed thousands of lives, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions. And I'm one of the millions of lives Salim has changed. So I'm really thankful for that. By unanimous acclamation, the Board of Directors of the Acton Institute bestows the Guardian of Freedom Award upon Jose Salim Matar, Jr. for faithfully defending the principles of freedom, for his willingness to assume risk in the face of political economic adversity, for his tireless defense of free enterprise without regard for personal safety and reputation, and for his immeasurable contribution to building and sustaining the largest network of free market leadership in Brazil. Mr. Matar's extraordinary efforts and accomplishments reflect great honor and credit upon himself, his family, his colleagues, and his country. Presented this day, the 21st of June, 2023, in the city of Grand Rapids at Acton University. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Chris Morin and Pad Sirico and the Board of Directors of the Acton Institute for this 
Honorable Award. 2,000 years ago, on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, Western civilization emerged by the own Greek philosophy and the culture, on Roman law and the state organization, and on the principles of the Catholic religion. Nowadays, economically developed liberal democracies share that very same culture. Is, it is the so-called Western culture that features lifestyle, better food, greater comfort, and the justice where everybody is equal before the law. This culture originates from desire and the human energy that drives us in the pursuit of objectives and goals. One of the pillars of this culture has been Judeo-Christian ethics as the basis of the legal system of democratic nations. Within Western culture, as a part of it, the conservatives who believe in an enduring moral order that subscribes to custom, convention, continuity, and the principle of pre-establishment guided by the principle of prudence. The conservative principle seeks to preserve the existing social, political, and economic order. Therefore, conservatism is a political and moral ideology, which believes that government and our society has a role in encouraging and stimulating values or behaviors considered traditional. Edmund Burke was the first explicit conservative political theorist who defined politics as an exercise in which one must respect a sure principle of conservation and a sure principle of transmission without excluding the principle of improvement. Conservation, transmission, and improvements would therefore follow a logical and non-arbitrary order. Edmund Burke is considered the father of conservatism, and Adam Smith is considered the father of liberalism. They lived at the same time, and we can say that conservatism and liberalism walked side by side in an absolutely convergent way and were the basis for the formation of the Western society we so greatly enjoy. We see in this context, the Acto Institute fulfills an important role promoting a free and virtuous society through individual liberty and religious principles, according to the teachings of Lord John Acton, such as, but not limited to, dignity of the person, human action, rule of law, and the subsidiary role of government and economic liberty. Thanks to values such as these and others advocated by the Acto Institute, we can enjoy a quality of life and the fundamental freedoms which place the individual as the center of society, as the most important piece on the chessboard of human life. Once again, my deepest thanks, my gratitude for such a high distinction in receiving this award. Thank you.
It is my pleasure now to introduce this evening's plenary speaker. And as a reminder, we will be once again taking your questions through slido.com using AU2023 as the code. Bishop Robert Barron is the Bishop of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester in Minnesota and the founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries. Bishop Barron received a master's degree in philosophy from the Catholic University of America and a doctorate in sacred theology from the Institut Catholique de Paris. He is the host of Catholicism, a groundbreaking award-winning documentary about the Catholic faith. Bishop Barron is also a number one Amazon best-selling author and one of the world's most followed Catholics on social media through his regular YouTube videos, Word on Fire podcast, and daily reflections. His evangelistic work is seen and reached millions of people every year. And on a personal note, I should add that my own family has benefited greatly from Catholicism and one of my go-to podcasts for commentary, philosophy, faith, and culture is his Word on Fire podcast. So please join me in welcoming Bishop Robert Barron. <clears throat> Well, thank you, kind sir, for that. Thanks, everybody. I can't see you now with the lights in my eyes, but what a magnificent room just to come in this place tonight and see this uh, crowd. What a tribute to uh, Father Sirico and to the Acton Institute, uh, which I think has made a massive contribution to both church and society. So I want to pay tribute to Father Sirico, but to the board of directors, too. Just marvelous and a much needed conversation between the classical religious tradition and the economic and political traditions, a conversation that often, as you know, doesn't happen uh, creatively. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, Father has invited me before, but it was more difficult when I was in California. Now in Minnesota, it's a little easier flight over here to Grand Rapids. Listen, I want to talk to you tonight about um, wokeism, not because I like it, but because I hate it. And, <laughs> and I... I think it's having a it's having a massively deleterious effect on our, our culture. It's found its way into almost every nook and cranny of our civilization now. One of our major political parties is largely organized now, it seems to me, to support wokeism. But I think it's very important, everybody, if we stand against it as I do, that we do so in a sophisticated way. And to recognize that wokeism is not a um, ephemeral phenomenon uh, that came out of the summer of 2020. Wokeism has a um, long and easily recognizable, it seems to me, intellectual pedigree. And the more clearly we grasp that, the more creatively we'll be able to engage it. Uh, I'm going to begin not so much with a definition, but a description. Wokeism, I would say, is a popularization of critical theory. It's a popularization of critical theory, critical theory having made its way now out into the streets. What's critical theory? Well, it's a movement that obtained largely in the French and German academies in the middle of the 20th century. Think of people such as Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, maybe the major names. But critical theory, found its way in the late 60s and 70s into the American Academy. I just finished a biography of René Girard, and Girard himself, though I think would be an opponent of wokeism, but he was involved in organizing a conference at Johns Hopkins in the late 60s, where uh, Derrida came over for the first time to these shores, and he said it was the moment when French structuralism and postmodernism made its way into the American Academy. Well, there it just stated, it seems to me, for several decades, and then broke out as a kind of bacillus into the wider um, bloodstream of the society, indeed in that summer of 2020. So what I'm going to try to do tonight in this very brief compass is lay out some of the features of critical theory, which has now uh, expressed itself as wokeism, and then just to suggest how Catholic social theory stands dramatically athwart the assumptions behind wokeism. Okay, so here's the first quality, I think, of critical theory. What I will call 
a radicalization of the modern sense of the self. A radicalization of the modern sense of the self. Now, as you know, the two probably major figures in the emergence of typically modern philosophy would be Rene Descartes and Immanuel Kant. Uh, I've told my students over the years, if you want to see the place where modernity was born, you can find it. It's in the German city of Ulm. Because Descartes was wandering around with the French army, and he, he slipped off. He was searching for the foundations of philosophy. And he said he retreated to a heated room in the city of Ulm. And there he came up with the famous cogito ergo sum, right? I can doubt everything. I can doubt the received tradition. I can doubt religion. I can doubt even sense experience. But the one thing I can't possibly doubt is that I'm doubting. Hence, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am. Now, notice the move, though, that Descartes makes here is he compels the objective to come before the bar of the subjective for adjudication. Because now the cogito reigns supreme as the arbiter of truth. Also on this basis, he distinguishes between what he calls res extense, extended things out there, and then res cogitantes, thinking things in here. The radical division between body and soul is bequeathed to modernity as a typical anthropology. Now, the second figure, Immanuel Kant, you see it famously in his critique of pure reason when the classical metaphysical categories of time and space and identity and substance are not out there in the world. They're already in here as a priori structures of the mind, right? So we project these realities onto the world. Same thing in Kant's moral theory. Remember, he says, the only thing that can be called good without qualification is a good will. That means I'm not looking to, to my acts in the world to determine what's right or wrong. I'm looking at the quality of the will that chooses. The move, again, privileging the interior over the exterior. I think you could argue, read Cyril O'Regan on this point, uh, that Descartes and Kant do represent a recovery of ancient Gnosticism, which in a very similar way privileged the sort of inside over the outside, tended to see the body as something dangerous and problematic and the real self inside. Now, critical theory, I would argue, radicalizes this modern sense of the self. So that the interior, the real me in here, is dramatically privileged over what's out there, over the exteriority of the body. If you don't see this influence in present-day gender theory, you're not paying attention. I mean, what do we hear all the time? And it's extraordinary to me how taken for granted it is, though it's a terribly uh, erroneous uh, anthropology. But it's taken for granted. Well, I mean, deep down inside, this is who I am. It just doesn't correspond to my body, so I have to change my body accordingly. That's a radicalized modern self, the privileging of the interior over the exterior. Just by way of contrast, consider this little line from St. Thomas Aquinas, my intellectual hero. Aquinas says, the soul is in the body, yes, but not as contained by it, but rather as containing it. Let me say that again, because I think there's a whole revolution in consciousness there. The soul is in the body, yes, but not as contained by it, like it's deep down in here, hidden someplace, but rather as containing it. The body, Thomas calls it the form of the body, the soul rather, the form of the body includes the body, animates the body, makes the body what it is. Therefore, this dichotomization between the real me in here and the body out there doesn't work. It's just erroneous anthropology. So there's a first theme, the radicalized modern self. I think we have to stand athwart that. Here's a second quality of critical theory and therefore of wokeism the relativization of the truth. 
One of the principal marks, I think, of postmodernism and critical theory is a deep skepticism in regard to any truth claims, except their own, by the way. <laughs> that's, that's all, that argument goes back to Plato and Augustine. Whenever you take a radically skeptical position, well, what about your own theorizing? But well, hang on. I think they take a cue here from Nietzsche's perspectivalism, that you know, we never get a grasp of the way things are, but only our limited perspective on them. So they consistently pull back the curtain on truth claims to reveal the power plays you know, that are actually going on. I'll come back to that. But I think the inspiration for much of this is in maybe the patron saint of critical theory, namely Jacques Derrida. His densely complex texts, famously unreadable, but they function as a kind of scripture for postmodernism. Derrida, as you know, is famous for the deconstructionist approach. Now, what does he mean? Well, he deconstructs what he calls the logocentric approach of classical philosophy, which is to say, logos, language, words, can get us in touch with reality. Think of Aquinas, the, the correspondence of mind to reality mediated by language. It gives us access to the way things are. Derrida deconstructs that kind of logocentrism. And he says famously in his French, il n'y a pas de hors texte. There's nothing outside the text. I've, I've got a text, and in classical thought, this text will get me in touch with the way things are. It'll get me in touch with the truth. But for Derrida, il n'y a pas de hors texte. There's nothing outside the text. Rather, what you have is an endless play of what he calls difference, difference. This, this word is not like that word, and this word relates to another one which is not like that one. And I stay permanently within the context of the text, meaning always deferred, and hence his famous play on words, difference, the difference of words, leads to difference, meaning deferral of meaning. I never know what things really are. It's always open-ended. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it's, it's in the common rhetoric of even teenagers today, right? They've, it's become the default position of, of most young people. There's no such thing as a real grasp of truth, but only an endless play of opinion, perspective, point of view, difference and difference, always deferring meaning. I, I heard uh, Derrida at a conference once. Someone asked him, how would you define deconstruction? And he answered in his French. He said, deconstruction means viens. We, oui, we, oui. come, yes, yes. <laughs> that sounds nice, but what does he mean? He means, look, I, I, I don't, this, this isn't the final answer here. This is not the truth, but there's always something new that can come, something fresh, some new way of configuring a text, some new way of thinking about it. Viens, we, oui, we. Oui. Permanent deferral of meaning and truth. That's a basic insight of Derrida. And what was once sort of whispered in the, you know, recherche heights of the French Academy has come now to be, as I say, the default position. You know, who am I? What's the purpose of my life? Uh, what gender am I? Viens, oui, oui. You know. Come on, I'll think of it in a fresh way. Don't be tied to old perspectives. Be open. Right? You know, here's something that when you read the, uh, the woke theorist today, the comically absurd position that even math and science, even basic mathematical uh, statements, two plus two equals four, no, no, that's an expression of white supremacy. <laughs> that's an expression, I'm not, do you think I'm joking? I mean, that's exactly what they'll say, that math and science, even in these fundamental ways, are just plays of power because you can never say that something is true. Yeah, we, we, always a new perspective. Okay, third quality of 
the critical theory, and therefore wokeism, what I would call a fundamentally antagonistic social theory. Now, hear the influence of Karl Marx. And Karl Marx is all over critical theory, and therefore, at least implicitly, all over wokeism. Marx is, you know, basing himself on Hegel's dialectical sensibility, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, the constant, you know, ongoing development of absolute spirit, all of that. Marx takes that in, turns it on its head, makes it a dialectical materialism, and therefore reads history as the endless play, the antagonistic conflict between warring groups. He also took from Hegel, and this is very influential, it seems to me, in the present day conversation. He took in Hegel's idea of the master-slave relationship. And when you read Hegel on that, it is fascinating. He's got wonderful insights about it. But that category of master-slave, becomes a dominant category in Marx. What you have in history is a constant antagonistic play between the domineering one and those who are dominated, masters and slaves. What's the purpose of Marxist social theory, as he famously says? Philosophers have so far only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So the purpose of Marxist philosophy is to foment a class struggle, foment the rebellion of the slaves against the masters to bring about the communist uh, uh, revolution. Watch how the uh, critical theorists and the wokeists today take this basic Marxist idea, but they extrapolate from it so it's not restricted to the economic oppressors and oppressed but all sorts of other forms of masters and slaves. So we talk about colonial oppression, sexual oppression, racial oppression, gender oppression, etc. But the same dynamic holds, that we have a master-slave, oppressor-oppressed binary. Speaking of binaries, again the influence of Jacques Derrida. In Derrida's analysis of language, he says that there are basic binaries within our linguistic system. And our, our um, sense of meaning often comes from how we play these binaries off one another. What does he mean? Well, male, female, straight, queer, Western, non-Western, civilized, uncivilized, white, black, etc. These binaries, Derrida says, haunt our language. And it's the way we tend to generate meaning. So he says, for example, male, straight, civilized, and white tends to rule over female, queer, non-Western, and uncivilized. It's almost like a computer language. You know, it's, it's on or off. It's one or it's zero. You have these binary options within the linguistic structure. I think that's found its way very much into wokest uh, social theory. What we have are these binary oppositions. Much of the strategy, Marxist in form, remains the same. To speak for those who are considered on the underside of these binaries. To foment, indeed, a struggle between the binaries of oppressor and oppressed. Notice how in so much of the woke theorizing, you, you have to fall on one side or the other of this binary. There's no third option. There's no blending of them. You're one or the other. That's the antagonistic social theory. Fourthly, and this again is very much from Marx, the play of substructure and superstructure. I was especially struck in the summer of 2020 by this because I heard it all the time in the rhetoric of the woke activists. Remember in Marx's social theory, Marx is a radical reductionist, right? I mean, everything comes down to economics. It comes down to that basic economic struggle. That's the core of a society. That's the substructure. And then around it, Karl Marx said, there emerges this massively complex superstructure whose sole purpose is to protect and defend the substructure. So for Marx, you got economics, 
or in his case, it was the capitalist economy. And then around it is everything else in society. Politics, art, entertainment, sports, religion, the military, government, all of it is simply part of the superstructural defense mechanism by which that substructure is defended. You know, like in Marx's theorizing, as you know, um, what's the whole point of politics? Just to defend the capitalist substructure. That's all politicians are finally interested in. What's the entire purpose of the military? To protect economic interests. That's why we go to war. And Marxists, if you read them to this day, will defend or describe every war ever fought as basically an economic uh, struggle. How about the arts? Well, the arts are patronized by wealthy people, and the arts tend, therefore, to support and protect the wealth-generating quality of the capitalist economy. Maybe most famously for Marx, religion. So what's the, the point of people like me? Well, I'm a drug dealer for Marx, because religion is the opium of the masses, right? It's meant to, it's meant to, to drug us into a kind of you know, insensibility so we don't realize the pain produced by the oppressive economic system we're in. Why are people like me fostered by a civil society? Because it's good for everybody that there are drug dealers around to calm people down. Religion's whole purpose, again, is to protect the economic substructure. Well, again, can you see this practically everywhere in wokeism? The conviction that, now again, choose your form of oppression, whatever you know, your theory is, whether it's gender oppression, it's, it's colonialism, it's uh, slavery, that that's what stands at the heart of the civil society. And everything else exists simply for the sake of protecting it. You know, a good example of this is the 1619 Project, right? Uh, what does it all come down to? Slavery. And, and the attempt to protect and defend the slave economy. And so that project, in a very Marxist way, reads all of society through that very particular lens. Um, did you notice that during the, the summer of 2020, these almost manic attempts to tear down the various institutions of our society? You know, most famously, defund the police, but there were lots of attempts, seems to me, tear down the legal structure, tear down the government, tear down the police department. Well, that's part of a Marxist form of analysis. If these things exist simply to protect a form of oppression, then we should get rid of them. Okay, I've got eight minutes. Lastly, I think critical theory, and therefore wokeism, sees power as the supreme category power as the supreme category. You know, if you're interested in the history of philosophy, this is a very intriguing proposal. Because power is, um, power is talked about a lot by the major philosophers. Think of someone like Thomas Aquinas. He would see God as all-powerful, yes indeed. But he would also see God as simple, Therefore, all the divine attributes and qualities are finally one. Thus, God's power cannot be at odds with God's manner of being. Now you say, well, that's very abstract, but there's a very interesting upshot to all that. Could God, in his infinite power, make it the case that 2 plus 2 equals 5? Well, heck, he's infinitely powerful. I, I guess, why not? Could God, in his infinite power, make adultery a virtue? Well, I guess. I mean, he's declared adultery to be bad, but could he declare it something good? I, I suppose he could, right? Thomas's answer is, well, of course not, because you're driving a wedge thereby between God's power and God's manner of being. Therefore, it's no restriction on God's power to say God can't make 2 plus 2 equal to 5. Because 2 plus 2 being equal to 4 is simply a participation in the truth that God is, right? It, it's no limitation on God's power to say he can't make adultery a, a virtue. 
Because that would be at odds with his own manner of being. Thomas famously asks, can God sin? Well, and the objector says, well, of course God can sin. God is infinitely powerful. Heck, I can sin. And so why couldn't God sin? Well, no, says Aquinas. Of course God can't sin. It would be repugnant to his manner of being. Okay, now why is this important? Because when you get past Aquinas now, into the late medieval and early modern periods, something has shifted. What emerges is a voluntaristic view, so voluntas, will, where the primacy of the will is emphasized. Indeed, God's potentia absoluta, his absolute power, is divorced from his being. So that, indeed, René Descartes can say, if God so chose, two plus two could be equal to five. The voluntaristic God has a power that can overrule, redefine reality. See, and that's a departure from what we found in Aquinas. Is it accidental, therefore, that in many of the modern philosophers, power becomes hyperemphasized? You see it, for example, in Schopenhauer. You see it maybe most obviously in Friedrich Nietzsche. God is dead, right? Therefore, where did that potentia absoluta go? It went to me. It went to us. We now have this will to power. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me who I am. I can decide on the basis of my absolute freedom the nature of reality. Does that begin to sound familiar? I think coming right up out of the voluntaristic shift in late medieval, early modern philosophy to the contemporary period, the voluntaristic God has morphed into the voluntaristic, all-creating, all-defining self. You know, many in this room would remember Casey versus Planned Parenthood, right, 1992, the famous, infamous decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in an uh, abortion case, where the justices said it, it belongs to the nature of liberty to determine the meaning of life and of existence. Oh, is that all I get to decide? <laughs> you know? But see, what is that? But that's, again, the, the transplanting of the potentia absoluta of God now into the potentia absoluta of the self. Now, along with Derrida, I would say the most influential of these um, critical theorists is Michel Foucault. You heard that I was a doctoral student in Paris as many years ago, and I, I arrived in 1989 in Paris. Foucault died in 1984, and you know how Paris, there's a, there's a restaurant and a bookstore on every block, right? And as you walk around Paris in those days, looking out from the window of every bookstore was the sort of owlish visage of Michel Foucault. I mean, he was the dominant philosophical figure. What stands at the heart of his philosophy? All these claims to truth and to goodness and to value, and, you know, these are objectively the case, forget it. That's powerful people using language and coercion to hang on to their power. There's nothing objectively right or wrong about any of that. It's all finally about power. Listen to the wokus theorist today. It's Michel Foucault for the masses, right? Anyone, like the people in this room who would say, no, I think that's objectively true, or I think that's objectively the morally right thing to do. No, no, no. I'm just going to pull back the curtain on that to show the plays of power. The capacity for self-invention, rampant. Games of power, everywhere. That's one of the marks of wokeism. Okay? So, having just sketched those little moves, can I just say in conclusion a quick word about Catholic social teaching? 
our social teaching in the Catholic Church would indeed say that each individual person is a subject of infinite dignity, but not the creator of value. See, I, I think everybody, that is supremely dangerous talk. When we say, along with this sort of critical theory stuff, that, that the sovereign self invents value, we are on a very short road to a moral chaos. Rather, we would say, at the heart of our social theory ought to be love. What's love? Thomas Aquinas said, not a feeling. Love is an act of the will. It's to will the good of the other. If that's true, then I can't love anyone unless I have a keen sense of what is objectively good. If I'm inventing value, I got my value, you got your value, and let's just vaguely tolerate each other, then we can't love each other because love has to display itself, as it were, against the background of a hierarchy of objective value. Otherwise, I don't know what, it, what I should will for you. Catholic social theory seems to me stands athwart the value-generating self and stands in favor of a hierarchy of objective value, both epistemic and moral. Secondly, Catholic social teaching does not advocate antagonism as the fundamental reality in the Marxist manner. Rather, it posits a cooperative view. Individuals cooperating with one another, indeed social classes cooperating with each other, owners and workers, you want to use the old kind of Marxist terms, cooperating with each other. It stands athwart the view that we have to see society in antagonistic terms. Also, Catholic social theory stands against the Marxist substructure, superstructure reading, seeing it as hopelessly simplistic and dangerous. Dangerous because it sees everything other than the substructure as, as a problem that has to be unmasked or undone. Rather, Catholic social theory sees society as a very complex web of individuals and institutions subsisting in mutuality. But whenever you say it all comes down to, now fill in the blank, you're wrong, right? <laughs> Society is a complex web, and how beautiful for that very reason. Finally, it seems to me, Catholic social teaching decidedly does not hold to the primacy of power in this quasi-voluntarist way. Rather, it sees, I would say, justice and love as supreme. What's justice? Rendering to each his due. That's the classic Platonic definition. What's love? As I said, willing the good of the other. See, those are absolute values. It's a point I made in a talk I gave at Notre Dame a few months ago. They, the kids asked me about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I said, well, sure, those are values a secundum quid, as the medieval would say. They're, they're values, you know, depending on circumstances. They're values as far as they go. One thing I said to them was, you think you're a radically inclusive community here at Notre Dame? And heads were nodding. I said, well, how many people were excluded from the admission process so that you could be included? That's where they, yeah, well, it's, it's a very simple point that inclusivity, sure, it's a good thing, secundum quid, you know, depending on circumstances and sometimes under certain circumstances. Same with, with the equity and inclusion. They're, they're good secundum quid. But see, justice and love are values in se. They're valuable in themselves. And, and the way to test that, could you ever imagine it would be right to do something unjust. Well, well no, of course not. It, would it ever be right not to be loving? Well, well, no, of course not. 
Because those are absolute values. I think everybody, and I'll close with this, that that's the reason why we should stand against the diversity, equity, inclusion. Because it's like liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? It's like the, the triplet that came out of the French Revolution. Those two were values secundum quid. When you try to make secondary values primary values, you lead your nation by a short route to chaos. What we ought to cling to are those values that are in se good, like justice and love. Okay, that's the end of my little sketch. Um, I hope it gave you, <laughs> thank you. I hope it just gave you some sense of how, how to engage wokeism uh, in an intellectually serious way. Mind you, they don't want to do that because they, they want to put it onto very emotional grounds. But I think it's very important for us to know where the system of thought came from. Listen, thank you again, everybody. Delightful to be with you tonight. Thanks. Well, thank you, Your Excellency. What an excellent talk. And <clears throat> we've got lots of questions coming in, and I'm going to go straight to them, even Good. though I have several in the back of my own mind. You know, you ended in focusing on love and some of the yeah. key dimensions of Catholic social teaching that counter some of this wokeism. So there are a couple of questions from members of the audience that focus on this idea of love, one of which is, Many young people embrace woke ideas with the good intention of seeking to love their neighbor and yeah. the poor. How can we show them that this is not true love? Yeah, and that's a, that's a typical rhetorical move, and I, I hear that all the time. Look, Bishop, doesn't wokeism just mean that we should be awake to social injustice and try to fight it on behalf of, of the underprivileged and so on? Sure, if that's what wokeism means, of course, then I'm woke and I'm all in favor of it. But... I, that's not what it means. That, in fact, when you read the theorists, what you get is, I think, what I was describing. So, no, I, of course, if, if you see real injustice, you fight it. Mm. And to me, that's a, that's a basic principle of, of common decency as well as Catholic social teaching. Um, so if that's all you mean by, by wokeism, fine. Stick with love. You will the good of the other. Uh, and then that means you have to know what those goods are. Uh, uh, that can't be a matter of your invention of, of goods that correspond to your you know, private desires. You've got some keen sense of the objective quality of it. So I, I would say, sure, stick with love, but, but wokeism, as they des uh, their own theorists describe it, is much more than uh, just you know, caring for the poor. So you, so you mentioned that you need to also then know what the goods are that you're pursuing. And, and another question related to love is somebody had asked, how can we demonstrate to people that this ideology actually leads to ends that are quite sad and harmful? Yeah, well, I think it's obvious. I think it, it shows up in, in fact um, that when you walk down this path of I've got my values, you've got your values, we're going to vaguely tolerate each other, um, we don't have real coherence in the society. We don't have real communio. We just have a sort of... Um, you know, vague collection of individuals uh, uh, tolerating each other. So I, I think that's that's obvious in the in the very antagonisms that are that are uh, evident in our society. Go on social media any time mm. of the day or night, and you want to see a, a Hobbesian antagonistic society. Um, so I I, I think it, it's very plain that the disaffiliation from religion and the denial of objective moral and epistemic value has conduced toward a very contentious and litigious and dangerous society. I think that's plain. So, so given that, and if there are individuals that are claiming continually that there's, it's relativism, whether in truth claims or in morality, are we then just left with simply a power struggle? Yeah, I think we are. That's the problem. That's exactly what happens. And Nietzsche was right. I mean, so if God is dead... Well, then, then values are, are gone because values are grounded metaphysically in, in the supreme good or the unconditioned good. If that all disappears, what's left is the will to power. Mm. And who are you to tell me that I shouldn't assert my will whenever I can? Um, so I think that that happens as night follows day, that when God and objective value are marginalized. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, 
We have to re-enchant our young people, it seems to me. And it's great it kind of heroes and geniuses in the artistic realm, in the epistemic realm, in the moral order, who display value. Mm. I think of someone like, you know, Dietrich von Hildebrand would use language like that, is that you, when you see something that's objectively valuable, it, it changes you. You're not in control of it. It's in control of you, right? It rearranges your own interiority. If something is merely subjectively satisfying, to use his language, well, I, then I'm in charge of it. I'm in control of it. It's kind of finding its way within my system of, of apprehension. But the objectively valuable, like Mother Teresa, mm. you know, you see, or, or Maximilian Kolbe, like a great saint. Well, it, it, they, that rearranges you. Or uh, Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. You know, I don't like it. <laughs> How silly. To, to say something like that, because Beethoven's Seventh Symphony is reworking your consciousness. It, it, it shapes your world. I, I think we have to reintroduce our young people to that wonderful realm of objective value, which makes life so much more fun and interesting than this self-invention business. I mean, God mm. saved me from the little, what did Hemingway the, say, the well-lighted space of my own little tiny ego. Bore me to death with that. You know what I'm saying? But when, when an objective value appears, now life becomes rich and wonderful. So am I understanding you correctly then that it's effectively appealing through forms of beauty, that there yeah. might be a way to draw people, if, especially if you're being canceled and you can't even have dialogue. Maybe it's just a demonstration of, of forms well, of beauty. Right. One of my convictions is if you take the three transcendentals, um, the true and the good are really hard to get traction with today because of the relativism. But the beautiful has a way of sneaking past our resistance. Mm. You know, when you just show something, just read this, just look at this. It, it has a way of sneaking past our, our defenses and gets into people's psyches. I, I've argued, um, like Brideshead Revisited, which is one of the, mm. I think, the great Catholic novel of the 20th century. What first intrigued Charles Ryder, who's like a lot of people today, kind of a cool agnostic, right? Uh, but what first intrigued him about Brideshead was the beauty of it. And, and Brideshead, the manor house in that story, is, is evocative of the church, I think. Christ is head of his bride, the church, and all that. Um, it was the beauty of Brideshead that first intrigued him. And I find that's a good way into the hearts of people today. Mm. So I have to ask you, of course, you're a shepherd of a diocese, and yeah. then you have a very broad outreach to millions through social media. So we have time for about one more question. I'm going to pull this one. It's a little bit different topic, and that is, yeah. since you have such influence over social media, do you have or what is your theology of social media as a means to help counter some of these things that you're experiencing? Uh, I, I love social media, and I hate social media. So I mean, I, I'm <laughs> well aware of the dark side of it. I, I, I live with it all the time. But I'll tell you, theologically, what I would say I said this at the um, Synod on Young People. I was a delegate to that four years ago. And I said, precisely at a time when so many of the young people are disaffiliating, they're not coming to our institutions. You know, they're not coming readily to our parishes and, and church functions and lectures. But through God's strange providence, we've been given this tool where we can move out into their world. You know, when I first started doing um, YouTube videos, 2007. I, I had no idea. Would anyone watch these things? No idea, but we just launched them out there. And before I knew it, I'm getting, you know, emails from a sailor in the, in the China Sea, and I'm getting emails from Latin America. And you realize, boy, Fulton Sheen would have given his right arm for this technology, mm. you know, that we can be 24-7 all over the world. And the seeds can go out, which indeed they have, so I guess that's my theology of it, is that God, I believe, has given us a means to address people precisely at a time when it's really hard for the church to address them. Mm. Well, Your Excellency, we thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. As a reminder... Tomorrow we begin with Continental Breakfast, and the first set of lectures begins at 9 o'clock. But now we invite you to join us for hospitality. Thanks again for joining us, and thank you, Bishop Barron.
Good.